Okay, guys, I am back. And we're going to go ahead and start talking about the adaptive immune system. I'm trying to get my pen tool working here uh, so I can draw on the slides. Um, unfortunately, I had already recorded almost all of this video and it realized that the audio was not working. So we're having to do over here. Okay, so we're, as I mentioned, we're going to start talking about the adaptive immune system, but before we do that, let's run through and review the lines of defense one more time. So we've already talked about the first line and the second lines of defense. The first line includes those barriers to pathogens being able to get into the body in the first place, your skin, your mucous membranes. And then once organisms breach those barriers, they very quickly have to face your second line of defense, and that includes various cells that we've talked about, like neutrophils and basophils and macrophages, etc., as well as various chemicals that are produced by cells that are able to attack invaders nonspecifically. And one thing we really have not talked about with regard to the immune system yet is self versus non-self. Uh, since we're in a microbiology class, we've mainly been thinking about your immune system attacking pathogenic microbes. But really, your immune system is programmed to attack and destroy anything that is non-self. So anything that's not naturally part of your body. Uh, anything that is naturally part of your body would, of course, fall under the category of self. So when you think about it, there are things other than pathogens that you're exposed to on a daily basis. Pollen, that's not a pathogen, it's not a microbe, um, but it is non-self. It has molecules on its surface that are not molecules that are naturally present in your body, and so your immune system is programmed to attack those. And in some people, that uh, response goes overboard and you develop an allergy or people with peanut allergies, for example. Peanuts are non-self. They're not a pathogen. They're not gonna, peanuts aren't gonna multiply inside your body, hopefully. But on their surfaces, they have molecules that are different from the molecules on the surfaces of your cells. And so that is, they, that constitutes non-self. So it's something that your immune system can react to. And in some people, that reaction goes overboard. In other people, our immune systems have learned to tolerate uh, most things that we eat and don't react to them. So self versus non-self is very important. And your second line of defense, you know, the cells involved, the chemicals that are involved, they have to be able to distinguish between self and non-self so they don't wind up attacking and destroying uh, your tissues. The major way that we talked about that, them doing that was by recognizing those PAMPs on the surfaces of microbes and binding those with the pattern recognition receptors on the surfaces of neutrophils and macrophages. But then many of the chemicals that are involved also specific, also target various types of uh, pathogens while hopefully leaving the cells of our body alone. So now we're gonna talk about this uh, third line of defense, which involves adaptive immunity and these are responses that are very specific uh, against a particular pathogen or a strain of a, of a pathogen or other specific things that are non-self, you know, like a particular molecule on the surface of a peanut if you have a peanut allergy. Um, so very, very specific, tailored responses. And another key feature, though, of adaptive immunity is that the adaptive immune system develops memory, so it's able to remember that you have been infected with a particular pathogen in the past, and the next time you get infected with it, that adaptive immune response is going to occur much, much more rapidly and hopefully get rid of the invading critters before they're able to make you sick. Okay, so what is it that your adaptive immune system reacts to? Your adaptive immune system reacts to molecules that are called antigens, and that is a generic word that literally refers to 
antibody generators. Of course, we're going to talk a whole lot more about antibodies, but antibodies are types of proteins uh, that target non-cell things that have invaded uh, your body and signal your immune system to get rid of those things from your body. Um, now, the term an antigen referring to antibody generators, your immune system does not only produce antibodies in response to antigens, it does other things as well. Um, but that's where the name originally came from. Um, another key feature about adaptive immunity, this is really important, an adaptive immune response occurs only after you have been exposed to a particular type of pathogen or a particular type of thing that is non-self. You've been exposed to very specific antigens on the surface of a pathogen or something else that's non-self. So if you've never been exposed to it before, you're not going to have adaptive immunity to it. Innate immunity, on the other hand, those are things that you have naturally. And even before you've been exposed to uh, gram-negative bacteria, for example, you already have ways of reacting to those gram-negative bacteria. Um, another important feature of the adaptive immune system, the adaptive immunity consists of humoral components and cellular components. Humoral does not refer to funny components, although some of you might think a lot of this is pretty funny as we go into it further. Uh, humoral refers to the word humor, which is a very old term referring to body fluids like blood and urine and mucus, etc. That's a really, really old term. Um, so humoral, in this case, refers to antibodies that float around. These are proteins. They're not cells. They float around in your blood plasma and other body fluids and try to find antigens to bind to. Uh, cellular immunity, of course, refers to the various types of cells that are involved in adaptive immunity, and that includes your T and your B lymphocytes, dendritic cells that we talked about in class the other day, and macrophages. Okay, so more. Okay, so now let's talk more about what antigens are specifically. In this diagram, we have here, you see a generic bacterial cell, but that bacterial cell could be any other type of microbe, it could be a virus, it could be a yeast cell that has invaded your body, or it could be something else like a pollen grain that is uh, not naturally part of your body. And now all across, as you guys have learned already, the surfaces of these microbes we're learning about are, are pretty complex. They can have many different types of molecules embedded in them. And those different types of molecules, many of them can be recognized by our immune system as antigens, something foreign that they can react to. So let's see, what they are showing you here on this bacterial cell is these little brown blobs here are supposed to be, again, these are not drawn to scale, how they would normally occur on a real bacterial cell. But each of those is supposed to represent uh, some type of antigen on the surface of the bacterial cell. Um, and then each of these little bumps that you see within the antigens are different locations within that antigen molecule. Now, antigens can be things like proteins. They can be polysaccharides. Uh, the lipopolysaccharides you've learned about in class, the peptidoglycan within the cell wall. Uh, you know, many of those are, are fairly large from a molecule standpoint. It can be fairly complex. So within an individual protein, you're going to have different locations within that protein. Um, and therefore, those become different little locations within antigens. And those specific locations can be referred to as epitopes. So those are specific portions of antigens that your immune system recognizes. And then what we also see in this diagram here is antibody A. 
here's antibody B. These are two different types of antibodies that have been produced by your immune system. And notice that they've got antibody A. And many antibody molecules, by the way, are shaped kind of like Ys like this. Uh, antibody A is binding to this triangle that's supposed to represent an epitope on one type of antigen. Antibody B is binding to these kind of little bump shaped features that are representing epitopes on a different type of antigen on the surface of this bacterial cell. Okay, so that winds up being very important. Different antibodies that are produced by your immune system are very, very specific about what they bind to and they bind to particular epitopes that are portions of particular antigens. Um, now many different types of things can be antigens. They don't have to be on the surface of a microbe or the surface of some other type of cell. They can also be things that are produced by a cell and are actually located inside that cell, especially if the cell is infected with a microbe. And they can even include toxins like the diphtheria toxin we uh, talked about or the enterotoxin of Staphylococcus aureus. Or they can be things on the surfaces of the foods that we eat, pollen, etc. Um, another term for epitope, which you may see if you are reading in your textbook, is antigenic determinant. Unfortunately, in bi biology, there are often multiple terms that refer to the same thing. Uh, let's see, I just alluded to the fact that not all antigens are necessarily on the surface of some sort of foreign cell or virus, but those that are um, are called exogenous antigens. So those are antigens that are either on the surface, like here's, here are some antigens, Look, these little purple things are antigens located on the surface of a bacterium. Um, that's supposed to represent a generic virus. So there are viral antigens located on the surface of the virus. Um, or if a bacterial cell secretes stuff, you know, releases proteins, for example, or toxins, uh, those things that have been released by the, uh, the microbe can also be considered exogenous antigens. Exogenous antigens just means those antigens are located outside. They're exogenous of your cells. They can be part of a microbial cell or they can be part of somebody else's cells. Like if you have a tissue transplant, they're just not part of your cells. Um, endogenous antigens, on the other hand, uh, those are represented right here. Uh, notice we've got a, a virus that has infected the cell, gone inside of it, so it's producing viral proteins and other molecules inside that cell. Um, many of those are going to function as antigens, but they're inside one of your cells, so those are considered endogenous antigens, inside your cells. Um, or these little pink spikes here that look just like the pink spikes on the surface of the virus. Uh, virus infected cells will very often display on their surfaces proteins that are actually produced by the virus. And those are other examples of endogenous antigens. Yes, the immune system can react to those, but they are located on the surface of your cell, so they're considered endogenous antigens. Okay. And then finally, there's a third type called autoantigens. Those are represented here in this diagram. Uh, now your cells, of course, have molecules all over their surfaces. And guess what? When your immune system is in the process of developing, um, those surface molecules can function as antigens. You have antigens on the surfaces of your cells but your immune system is programmed early on not to respond to those. That's called self-tolerance. The immune system 
learns to tolerate the antigens on the surfaces of your cells. And we'll learn a little bit more about how that all works later on. Now, if you get a transplant from somebody who does not have a good tissue match to you, that means that their surface antigens on their cells are different enough from yours that your immune system sees those as non-self and tries to attack those tissues. That's when you have a tissue transplant rejection. Okay, so I'm going to stop that one there, and then we'll move on to the next topic.